Good morning. Good morning. I am Judy Friedland, Commissioner for the Chicago Department of Buildings. Thank you so much for joining us today. There has been a lot of interest from the building community about our code modernization, and we're very excited to share our progress with you. The idea for these events started months ago when we were still in the review process. We knew that architects and engineers would want to understand the changes in the rewritten code as soon as possible. And there has been a great deal of excitement about this new code, and so that's part of it. And so here we are, less than a month since the historic code modernization ordinance was passed by City Council. And we're ready to share a lot of detailed information with you today. I'm going to talk a bit about our process to modernize the Chicago Building Code and the benefits that it will bring to the building community, our department, and the city as a whole. <coughs> Deputy Commissioner Grant Ulrich, who without him this code would have never happened, will detail the key changes to the code. This is the piece we know you're most interested in, and we will devote the majority of the presentation to this area. We also talk about our plan for future code updates and next steps. Today's session is being recorded and will be produced into a video that will be available on the Department of Buildings website. So please let your friends and colleagues know that they will be able to watch the session online in the coming weeks. We will send out a notification to our constant contact subscribers when the video is ready to be viewed on our website. For those of you that are not subscribers to our constant contact emails, I strongly urge you to go to our website and sign up. That way you get up-to-date information as it happens at the building department, and that will help you in your practice, and it will help improve the communication between all of us. Today, you'll learn how our consensus-based approach for updating the code with input from a wide variety of stakeholders kept the process moving forward and ultimately led to city council approval. We'll go over the timeline for implementation and how the updated code will affect building projects today and in the future. The code modernization is critically important for Chicago's building industry and will have a long-lasting impact on design and construction in the city for decades to come. And not just downtown, but throughout the city, in every neighborhood, and on every block. We believe it's a win for everyone in Chicago's building community. Homeowners, affordable housing advocates, developers, architects, contractors, building owners, and small businesses and preservationists. More important, or most important of all, it provides what the building and construction industry need most, certainty and predictability. For years, there has been a widespread recognition that Chicago is in need of a comprehensive, modernized code that is better aligned with national models and speaks the same language as everywhere else in the country. At the same time, we know that Chicago's existing code was very good and had evolved over time to respond to the city's unique urban environment and density. Our goal has been to keep parts of the existing code that work well, remove parts that have become antiquated, and adopt the terminology, framework, and classification systems that are used elsewhere in the country. We undertook this process knowing that it would be difficult, but well worth the effort for the numerous benefits that it provides. Aligning more closely with model codes provides many more resources for help both internal and external users. Understand what the code requires and why. This helps streamline the permit process further. It also provides more options to design and build with the widest range of cost-effective materials and technologies, while also enhancing building safety and promoting energy-efficient, sustainable buildings. It ensures that in Chicago, architects and builders have more flexibility to continue our long tradition of innovation in construction and design. And by aligning with national model codes, it will be easier for the building department to keep the codes up to date. This is a multi-year process. A lot has already been accomplished in a relatively short period of time, but we still have a lot of work to do.
We started phase one in 2015 as soon as I became commissioner with the electrical code and the conveyance devices code updates. At the time, the electrical code had not been updated since 1999. We started by reinstating the Chicago Electrical Commission in 2015 after a hiatus of 14 years. We worked closely with the Electrical Commission for over a year to review the existing code and how to best align it with national standards. Chicago became one of the first cities to adopt the 2017 National Electrical Code. The changes to both the electrical code and conveyance device codes took effect in 2018, and the transition has been remarkably smooth. That brings us here today to phase two, which centers on Chicago's core requirements for construction, renovation, and maintenance of buildings. It includes updates to administrative provisions, the building code, energy conservation code, rehab code, and existing building code. The changes here are the main focus of today's presentation. The remaining code updates are part of phase three. This is planned to begin at the end of this year and continue through 2021. The important topics that will be addressed in phase three include requirements for plumbing, mechanical, ventilation, refrigeration, natural gas, hazardous occupancies, signs, and trade licensing. We will also revisit the accessibility and energy conservation codes. And that will complete the current modernization effort. This is a big project, at least 13 different codes that together form the Chicago construction codes. However, the purpose of this project is not to create codes that we won't revisit for another 70 years. We'll be able to update much easier along with the rest of the country and the national models. And so that's another huge benefit, as you know, for us. The code modernization creates a new foundation and provides a framework to keep our codes more up to date and to take a more active role in driving development of the model codes. So we will have influence on the rest of the country as well because we have so much innovation and design and expertise here that it'll be exciting to be part of the national conversation and to be a leader in it, I'm sure. Every big project must start with a good plan and a strong framework to build on. We know from the previous failed attempts to rewrite the building code that we were going to need an outline, an aggressive but realistic timeline, and a way to manage expectations in order to keep the project on track. The outline became the Code Modernization Handbook. Starting with a tangible, cohesive document where everything could go was one of the most important tools in this process. It created a framework and a path forward and helped establish what was and wasn't possible. We formed six technical working groups compromised of more than 80 architects and engineers from the private sector. They participated in weekly meetings with our staff for three months from December 2018 to early March 2019. The working group members were incredibly dedicated and brought a wide range of insight to the process. During this time, we also met each month with about 70 industry leaders, including building owners, developers, labor leaders, design professionals, and affordable housing advocates. Each working group discussed their ongoing work and solicited feedback from the larger group. These meetings proved to be very valuable in helping to manage expectations and build consensus among a wide variety of interest. Together with the hard work of our technical working groups and the support of our stakeholders, we drafted a very large monumental ordinance in a very short span of time, over 730 pages. On March 13, 2019, we introduced the ordinance to City Council. Leading up to and during the City Council meeting, we demonstrated to the aldermen that there was broad support for the ordinance throughout the building community. We gathered more than 25 letters of support and more than 350 signatures, and leaders came to the hearing to testify in favor of the ordinance. The ordinance was passed unanimously by the full City Council on April 10th, 2019. It represents the full rewrite of the building code in 70 years. The ordinance passage was a huge milestone. 
but our work is far from over. The ordinance is drafted to phase in over 14 months. The energy code updates will take effect for permit applications started on or after June the 1st. The administrative provisions will take effect July the 1st. We will invite a few projects to test the new code beginning in the fall. The code will become optional on December the 1st and mandatory for permit applications on August 1st, 2020. The retroactive minimum standards for existing buildings will be implemented in spring of 2020. In order for a smooth transition to occur, there will need to be training and support throughout the industry. The Department of Buildings will have a lot of work to do in-house to get ready for applications by December and inspections by December of 2020. For our self-certified architects and structural peer reviewers, the building department will offer update training at the end of the year. We expect the code to be published in a user-friendly format by the International Code Council in mid-October. A read-only version will be available for free and full print and electronic versions will be available for purchase. Now it's time to cover the key changes in Chicago's new building code. Grant Ulrich, our in-house code expert, will lead this part of the presentation. We anticipate that you may have questions during the presentation. With this large of an audience, we ask that you hold your questions until the end of the presentation. Thank you, and without any further ado, I present to you Grant Ulrich. Thank you. So, I'm very excited to be here today to talk about our new code. Uh, I think we're all very excited, Department of Buildings. Um, so a few things about my part of the presentation. So in this presentation, italics, just like in the I codes, is going to mean it's a defined term. Um, it's not perfect throughout, but it tries to point you in that direction. Uh, if it's in blue, that means it's something that's specific to Chicago. Uh, to try and point that out, there's some page numbers throughout, and those are referring to the Chicago ordinance, that 776-page ordinance that's on our website. That's what's out there for now for people to use. Uh, and as Commissioner indicated, it will be published in a more user-friendly form later this year by October before it goes fully into effect. But for people who want to be following along now, those blue page numbers throughout this presentation refer to that ordinance. Uh, and then blue italic text is going to refer to a Chicago defined term. Um, just another warning, um, just like today, the building code and the zoning ordinance are not the same. There's definitions that don't work the same. Uh, there's lots of other things throughout that don't work the same. We're always trying to get them to be closer together um, but this is not a Chicago unique problem. Most cities in the country, uh, buildings and zoning speak slightly different languages because they're regulating slightly different things, uh, and that's true today. So don't use anything in my presentation to argue with Steve or Patrick over at zoning. It's not going to work for you. Uh, so the presentation is going to go roughly in the order of the IBC chapters. Uh, we'll skip around a little bit, but uh, that's the organizational structure, and this is sort of a walkthrough the provisions of where you can find things and, and dive into a few things, but to try and cover the whole book in uh, the presentation time we have this morning, it really is going to be a sort of overview and a direction of where to find things as you explore the code on your own. So the first chapter of, of all the I-codes is a scope and purpose chapter uh, in Chicago. Um, we took those provisions out and the administrative provisions that apply to all of the codes, all of the Chicago construction codes as we're calling them, are in a Title 14A, um, so that is the provisions that start taking effect in July of this year. Those provisions try and restate pretty much what we're doing today in terms of when permits are issued, what's required on plans, how inspections work, uh, staff work orders, things along those lines. Um, then the new construction requirements are what we're going to be calling the Chicago Building Code. Uh, that's Title 14B. And then the building rehabilitation requirements, the requirements for renovations, additions, remodeling, are going to be in a new Title 14R based on the International Existing Building Code. Um, so just to help navigate through that Title 14A, those administrative provisions, again, at the beginning, there's some scope and application, and also I think Section 105 of that is the transition provision. So it spells out in legal language uh, what Commissioner summarized earlier about when various provisions of the code take effect and some of the special rules for phased permits or permits that start 
before and then you want a minor revision after some of these transition dates and how that would apply to you. Uh, chapter two in all of the codes is going to be the definitions chapter. That's going to have key things and then throughout the codes those terms appear in italics to point you back to look that it's a defined term. Chapter three is about enforcement and I know no one in this room is going to get in trouble so don't have to worry about what the department does to you if you do something wrong but that's why it's skipped on this list. Chapter four is about permits. That's probably the most important chapter for this audience, uh, understanding what we're expecting in the permit application, how the permit issues. And that leads to permit-related inspections, pre-occupancy requirements, some posting requirements uh, about structural floor loads or occupancy capacity, uh, and then approvals and appeals is our, towards the end of the administrative provision, so that's the alternative code approval process, the Committee on Standards and Tests, the Building Board of Appeals, and the rules that govern those processes if you need to use those, and we still expect people will have special things they wanna do that need to go above and beyond this new code. Uh, and then all of the monetary things that apply to the administrative provisions, uh, fees, fines, penalties, uh, cost of permits, is in a chapter 12 at the end, so as it changes over time, and every once in a while the city council decides to probably raise them, not lower them, um, that chapter can be pulled out and replaced uh, all at once instead of hunting through to find all of the places where dollar values change. So chapter two is the definitions chapter and uh, there's three, 400 definitions uh, in all of the code so I'm not going obviously cover all of them. Um, the first section of all of the definition chapter is going to be a section 201. That's general rules about definitions and how they apply and if something is not defined uh, where you might look to find guidance on what it means. Section 202 is going to be the core definitions. That's the list of terms with the definition next to them. And then Chicago has adopted a section 203 about measurements. So it's going to pull ideas about how you measure building height, building area, some of those key uh, things throughout the code, how you measure those a little more clearly. Again, not lining up completely with the zoning ordinance, but maybe leading to future alignment there. Um, key terms, most important terms, I think, to walk away from this presentation with. Approved, approved is a term that the model codes use um, sort of too generously. Uh, I think at national code hearings when people disagree uh, and city A thinks, oh, I'd love to allow that, and city B says, I'd never allow that in my life, um, they throw in approved by the code official so city A can get the, what they want and city B can get what they want, and the model code doesn't really say a lot about whether it's actually ever going to be allowed or not. So we tried to avoid that in Chicago because we don't have the time or resources to answer every little question about whether we're going to approve something on a case-by-case -case basis. So often approved is crossed out in our adoption, um, but when it remains, it really means something beyond, above and beyond our normal permitting processes. So that would be the Committee on Standards and Tests, alternative code approval, something documenting that a supervisor has looked at it and said, yes, this is uh, acceptable. Um, application of that provision of the code. Uh, throughout the code, the, the model code term, and commissioner does not like this, but the building commissioner is referred to as the building official. <laughs> she really does not like it. She's laughing in the front row. Um, deck, exterior balcony, and, and porch are very Chicago-specific terms. Those are defined um, you know, and, and continue to be important things that we have here. Fire separation distance is a, a model code term, but it's defined a little more generously then the model code defines it, so uh, there it measures to the far side of a street when it's facing a street or a public way instead of to the center line, uh, so that's something to keep in mind. Occupiable rooftop is our new defined term to cover rooftop decks, uh, that type of occupancy, which we have a lot of here in Chicago, and you look at some of the model code provisions that try and get to that subject, and I think they're written by people who have never seen one. So uh, we did a lot of work to, to make those actually work for us here in Chicago. Uh, and then Chicago for a, a long time has used a term called uh, technology center, which is defined as an office space that uses computers. I think even when that term was put in the code, probably every office space used computers in some form, so I'm not sure what it was trying to get at. Um, but we now have a term in, in the new code, telecommunications equipment area, which is getting really to those server rooms inside of office spaces where there is a slightly different hazard. Uh, and then entire server farm, server facilities uh, to provide some clearer regulations about what we expect building-wise uh, in terms of those. So just going over some of those 
measurement terms, I'll, I'll go through a few illustrations here. Um, so grade plane is a key term um, in the code, and it's an imaginary horizontal plane. So on a flat lot, that's very easy to figure out. Um, on a sloped lot, it's determined by measuring uh, the lowest point within six feet or the lot line of the building. And then for the Chicago specific condition of raised streets or sunken lots, uh, consistent with the zoning ordinance, that grade plane is never going to be lower than the curb line at the front property line. Um, row houses on separate lots are going to potentially have separate grade planes for each one. Um, and then for small lots, recognizing that we don't want too much difference between zoning, on lots up to 10,000 square feet in area, zoning grade and, and grade can be the same thing. You can uh, use the zoning definition and not uh, worry about that too much. For building height, building height is now going to be measured from that imaginary grade plane, and it's going to be to the mean elevation of the highest roof plane, which is a difference for what we've been doing um, for buildings um, in, on the building code side in Chicago. So this is going to be a change. There are two differences that still exist. So again, the zoning ordinance, uh, their measurement of height, this is closer to their measurement, but still different. And then there's a term mean roof height, which comes from the structural provisions. Well, for most of the provisions of the building code, you can't ignore things like mechanical penthouses. The wind doesn't ignore those. So the structural provisions measure mean roof height a little bit differently uh, in those conditions. So in the structural provisions, it's important to note that mean roof height might be a little higher than building height. Uh, there's seven exceptions that apply to building height as a definition, um, and, and you can look at those and go through those. They cover conditions about when there are occupiable rooftops, mechanical penthouses occupied and un unoccupied, certain dormers, complex roof shapes, parapet walls now up to 42 inches can be excluded, uh, and then a provision for excluding up to 12 inches of continuous insulation above a structural roof deck of a flat roof. So the current code would measure to the highest point of a flat roof. Um, the new code is going to measure to the midpoint of that roof, again with that rule if there is continuous insulation above the roof deck, excluding up to 12 inches of that. Uh, the zoning ordinance is still measuring to the underside of that roof structure of the highest story, which you know isn't too far off for this kind of building. Uh, for something like the East Building, the Lakeside Center at McCormick Place, very big difference in terms of where you're measuring to. So uh, we're going to continue measuring a little bit higher than zoning for most purposes with a flat roof building. With a pitched roof building, the current building code measures to the highest point. Uh, the new code will measure to the midpoint uh, and exclude that dormer if it meets exception five, which I think is about up to one third of the roof area. Um, zoning will continue to look at that dormer. It has no exceptions for dormers. So if the dormer has a higher roof plane than the main roof plane, it's going measured to the midpoint of that. Um, building area, again, zoning and buildings are going to be a little bit different. Zoning includes the thickness of exterior walls. Um, they're concerned about bulk and density in neighborhoods. Zoning has some other exclusions about parking and mechanical rooms up to a certain size. Uh, building code, as illustrated, excludes the thickness of the exterior walls, um, but it counts the area of covered porches, balconies, decks. Uh, if there's a roof above and it's an outdoor occupied space, that now is going to be added to your building area. Um, stories are complicated. There are some key terms. Attics are unoccupied space that, uh, if they meet certain conditions, are not counted as a story. Uh, basement is something other than a story above grade plane, which is not a helpful definition if you do it out of order. Um, there's some provisions about sleeping lofts that are barred from the International Residential Code, provisions for tiny houses, um, but they're allowed in a range of conditions in our code, so tiny houses, tiny apartments, uh, recognizing that uh, we don't necessarily have zoning or land for tiny houses, but we do have lots of micro apartments that are trying to do things like that. Mezzanines are larger, um, similar conditions, uh, similar Chicago limitations on them in terms of 20% and not the more generous allowances of the IBC for mezzanines. Uh, penthouses, there are provisions for occupied penthouses where they're going to have some space in them and they generally count as a story. And then mechanical penthouses or penthouses just containing uh, vertical circulation elevators and stairs that can be excluded from being counted as a story. Story, the key term here, and there is a definition for that. And then the new code is going to make a difference. I think our code today, when it talks about stories, usually talking about stories above grade plane, uh, but it is going to make a distinction between 
when you're a story above grade plane and you're counting for certain things and when you're a basement or a story that's not a story above grade plane. Um, occupancy classification, this is an area where I think it's going to make a big difference. Uh, Chicago today speaks a very different language. Um, many of us are used to it, uh, but I think there's a little bit more logic and a little more user friendliness to the IBC's classification system. So in the chapter, um, pretty simple organization, starts out with some general provisions, uh, then some provisions about how you classify things. The specific provisions for A through U are in section 303 to 311, um, and then the miscellaneous leftover occupancies are at the end in section 312. Again, um, the IBC classifications are largely being adopted. There are two Chicago specific, two or three Chicago specific changes. Um, one to highlight is that child daycare centers will be a group E2. So the daycare centers that are classified as schools today, uh, group C3, are going to move to a new group E2 to carve them out from all other school occupancies. Um, because Chicago is not adopting a, a separate residential code, like the I-Code family has, similar to New York City, um, to have special rules, usually uh, relaxed rules or more generous rules for those small residential buildings, one to three units, so our single family homes, two flats and three flats. We have created a new subgroup, subcategory uh, called R5, and that's the one to three unit non-transient -res non residential buildings up to four stories. And then for making the distinction between low hazard, both factory and storage occupancies, the model code and our code today relies on sort of certain quantities of combustible packaging being present. Often in, in most processes today we see there is some amount of combustible packaging, so very few things actually qualify for being a low hazard and most cla quali uh, are classified as a moderate hazard. So that will be the rule going forward if you want to prove up that you are, your project is entitled for low hazard classification, you'll have to go meet with the Chicago Fire Department and get their written approval of the operational plan uh, to really say that it is something like a rock crushing facility where there aren't going to be combustible materials involved. Uh, and then I previously mentioned telecommunication equipment area is going to replace the Chicago term of technology center, be a little more narrowly defined and it can either be a, a business occupancy if it's going to be regularly occupied or, or accessory to an office space, or it can be a storage occupancy if it's only going to have incidental human occupancy. Group R5, here's just an illustration again about this important category, uh, which especially if you're doing small residential projects is important to learn. Uh, it can be single family homes, two flats, three flats. It can be townhouses up to three together and you can connect them and, and break that with a firewall so you can have continuous uh, R5. Associated private garages are going to fall in that same category, whether they're attached or detached, and there is a four-story maximum on that classification. Um, chapter four, very detailed chapter. Uh, we're going to skim over a few provisions of it right now. Um, the scope saying that if you fall into any of the special categories defined in chapter four, you have to follow the special provisions of chapter four. I'm going to cover a few highlights. So high-rise buildings, uh, that's an important chapter and it's really a hybrid of IBC things and Chicago things that we've been doing for a long time. Uh, atrium provisions, um, that is amended again for Chicago to be more consistent with some things that we've been doing for a while. Motor vehicle related occupancies, so that's your everything from your private garages with single family homes up to your larger parking garages and parking facilities. And then there are some special provisions about dwelling units and sleeping units uh, in occupancies that have those residential living occupancy, uh, living conditions. Um, and at the bottom of the slide, there's a list of other things that you can find in this chapter uh, if you work on those specialized types of projects. High-rise buildings. Uh, so a high-rise building is going to continue to be defined as a building that's greater than 80 feet in building height. So it's not the IBC definition of figuring out the lowest level of fire department vehicle access and the highest occupied floor with an occupant load. It's going to be a, the simpler way of measuring that we've done for a long time in Chicago. Um, the two source water supply as today is going to continue to be re required at 300 feet. Um, and then there's some additional structural and operational integrity requirements that come in when you get to 400 feet. So uh, shaft ratings, 
uh, structural requirements, uh, diesel generator required as today, uh, and some enhanced requirements for spray-on fireproofing happen at 400 feet. Um, most high-rise buildings, again, when we talked about the definition of building measurement is changing a little bit. Most buildings are going to be the same height. A high-rise building that has a pitched roof, like the Newberry Library, uh, with that very big pitched roof, which is a high-rise building today, might, if remeasured under the new definition, no longer be a high-rise building because now it's going to be measured to the midpoint of that pitched roof instead of the highest point. Uh, for motor vehicle related occupancies, uh, it's going to be the small ones, the private garages and carports. Those requirements are pretty similar to what we adopted in 2017. I think we anticipated that some of this was coming along the way when we did that ordinance a few years ago. Uh, public parking garages are going to be uh, very differently defined than IBC does because IBC has some concepts that we didn't adopt in the parking area, including podium type buildings, uh, restrictions on motor fuel dispensing facilities can't be inside of a building, and some other limitations there. Repair garages, similar, higher hazard when you are doing repair work on vehicles and have hazardous chemicals or other things going on. And then the Chicago specific category of parking facilities, which is sort of a freestanding building, maybe with limited ground floor uh, retail or other occupancies, but primarily a parking occupancy uh, remains as a Chicago specific category. For chapter five, this is building height and area. So the key thing to think about here, this is an area where I think people have urged change for a while and, and there is some change, but it's really halfway between where we are today and where the model code would be in other places. So uh, again, navigating the chapter, it, it goes through and walks through with those provisions the height and area tables at the beginning, and then some specific things about mezzanines, building area, uh, mixed occupancy, and incidental uses later on. Um, in the mezzanine provision, as I said, it, it keeps the Chicago limitation of 20% generally on mezzanines. Um, for mixed use and occupancy, it is going to get into recognizing unseparated mixed uses for the first time and provide some clearer guidance on when you do have separated mixed uses going on in a building, uh, which is a very popular thing to do today, and we spend a lot of time uh, interpreting and walking people through sort of compromises to make our current code work in that area. Um, and we're going to have uh, clear requirements for separations of incidental uses. I think that's an area that is spelled out in our code today. Uh, some of them are all in one place, and then there's some few other, a few other scattered ones, so this is pulling them all together in one place. Um, some Chicago specific differences, so for buildings that are going to continue not to have a sprinkler system, and there's going to be lots more sprinkler systems required under this code, but for buildings that continue not to have them, and there's plenty where that's an option, the height and areas are really going to be very similar to what the current code allows. Um, but when you do add a sprinkler system, there's going to be a bigger bonus than the current code allows today, so you are going to get larger buildings of less fire resistive construction types allowed. Um, there is going to be the, the frontage increase provision in the model code is less generous than the current code for frontage. Uh, but again, there is the more generous bonus for sprinkler systems. And Chicago is going to, of course, allow you to build a podium type building where the first level is uh, a more fire resistive construction type with less fire resistive construction above. But there's not going to be any credit for that like in the IBC. So there really isn't going to be a concept of building a wood frame building starting two or three stories off the ground. Um, here's an example uh, illustration. I think it's a good illustration. The old code really limited uh, protected frame construction, old code 4A, new code 5A construction type to a three unit, three story residential building. And you really couldn't get mixed occupancies in there. You couldn't do other things. Uh, the new code is going to be a little more generous. It's going to with a sprinkler system, you can get up to a, a fairly good size four-story mixed use. Uh, with a sprinkler system, uh, non-residential uses on lower floors, whether that's mercantile, business, uh, parking. Uh, it may require far retardant treated wood for the exterior walls, depending on the distance to the property line. That's a Chicago amendment that we'll get to a little later on. Uh, in types of construction, so again, this is moving towards speaking the national language, so we don't have the confusion that we have today about what is uh, type 3C construction, what is type 1C construction. I've never heard of that. We get that a lot from, from people other places, uh, so we are moving to speaking the same 
language as the rest of the country on construction type classification with a few minor Chicago differences, but much more minor than today. Um, so here's a chart that roughly shows the correspondence between our current classifications and the new classifications. Uh, starting at the top, really R1A is very, very strict in terms of fire resistance. It goes a little overboard, I think, uh, compared to other standards out there and the latest in fire science. So the R1A today is a little bit less than IBC1A, so that's why that arrow is falling somewhere in the middle between IBC1A and 1B. 1B is, is roughly the same between the two codes. Um, Chicago 1C is now 2A. Uh, Chicago 2 is 2B. Uh, and then the threes, there's some switching around there because 3A Chicago becomes type 4 heavy timber. Um, and at the bottom of the chart, IBC type 5B, sort of unprotected frame construction, uh, whatever material you want and no fire resistance rating, um, really doesn't have an equivalent except with some exceptions in Chicago. So that's why that's a dashed line down there at the bottom of the slide. Um, ag again, we talked about type 1A is really becoming less and throughout the code really other than for firewalls and hazardous occupancies, the idea of four hour construction uh, is going away. So it still stays for hazardous construction, for hazardous occupancies, for containing that, and for firewalls. Uh, but in other areas, you're really going max out at three hours of fire resistance required, consistent with what people are testing out there and what products are available. The exterior wall, uh, new from IBC, is going to be based on fire separation distance instead of inherently based on the construction type. Uh, it's still going to have to rely on the construction type if the exterior walls are load-bearing, um, but that is going to be a change um, from what we're used to doing today. And then there is a clearer list of co permitted combustible materials in non-combustible construction, and also a recognition that that same list applies to the exterior walls of type three and four construction. Um, Chicago-specific things we did to mitigate between the transition between our code today and the new code, uh, recognizing that we've long recognized a 30-minute roof construction in residential buildings. Um, that will continue to be recognized for residential buildings up to four stories, um, less, less restricted than the IBC in that area. Um, table 602, that's the uh, fire separation distance base ratings is modified a little bit for urban conditions, so there's some conditions where you can be a little bit closer um, and less restrictive, uh, consistent with our code today. Chicago doesn't require, it will not, in the new code, recognized fire retardant treated wood in exterior walls of type three and four construction. So in non-combustible exterior walls, uh, we're not going to recognize fire retardant treated wood in those in the same way that the IBC would. That's the biggest difference, I think, in this chapter. Um, but Chicago will recognize fire retardant treated wood in frame construction, allowing you to build frame construction closer to lot line than we've ever allowed it before. Uh, so you will be allowed to be up to the lot line, closer than three feet to the lot line, uh, if that exterior wall of your type 5 building is built with fire retardant treated wood framing and then a exterior cladding that's a non-combustible material. So that's note J in table 602 if you want to read more about that, which I think is an exciting change for a lot of people. So fire and smoke protection features, this is the passive requirements, the firewalls, the fire partitions, the fire ratings uh, of the construction. Um, again, moving much more into the IBC world speaking the same language as the rest of the country in terms of some of these terms. The IBC-based classification of fire resistance rated assemblies is coming in. Uh, we're going to recognize some additional methods of establishing the fire resistance rating, so proving it up for plan review purposes. Opening protection is now also going to be based on that fire separation distance, so uh, instead of having an absolute rule of 12 feet from the property line, you get to have unprotected openings, and closer than that, you have to have protected openings, there is going to be a finer gradient consistent with the IBC and with some Chicago amendments, especially for residential buildings where we haven't had uh, opening protection requirements before. Uh, IBC-based requirements for fire-resistant joints and penetrations, many people have been building those for insurance reasons or otherwise. Uh, they weren't really in our code, um, but they will come in more consistent, much more consistent with the national standards for that. Um, similarly, uh, fire rated doors, windows, other assemblies recognized so you won't have to translate the relatively out-of-date Chicago provisions to find products that meet them. 
uh, prescriptive fire resistance rated assemblies, all of those helpful things at the back of the IBC chapter seven um, are going to be recognized by us, so there will be less need to go to outside sources to find rated assemblies. Uh, and then for special cases uh, with approval, so again, probably the alternative code approval process, we will recognize calculated fire resistance rated assemblies or engineering judgments, but that is going to require uh, someone supervisor level or above in the department to look at that outside of the permit process. Uh, the fire resistance re requirements for exterior wall protections more clearly spelled out and, and there's some very helpful tables that we developed there to make it clear when you have features, uh, porches, balconies, cornices, other things and, and how close they are to the lot line what fire resistance requirements they need to meet. Um, there are some modified opening limitations for low rise residential buildings, so residential buildings up to four stories where we haven't had opening protection required before. Um, there is a modified table for those for Chicago, so don't, if you do that type of building and you read the first table, keep reading because there is a second table on the next page. Uh, some people don't get that far and call with concerns. Um, firewalls, so firewalls in Chicago will continue to be four hours. The idea of the eight hour firewall in Chicago, which I don't think anyone actually ever built, um, is, is gone. Um, but the, instead of the IBC, occupancy-based table of, of different ratings of firewalls, all firewalls will continue to be four hours, um, but the IBC structural integrity requirement, which is also challenging to meet, um, is not adopted, so the idea that the wall needs to stay standing when buildings on both sides collapse is not a requirement in our code, so it will continue to allow those firewalls to be offset as you go up through a complicated building, um, and there's also a new recognition that um, the Chicago vestibule can go away and you can have three hour rated doors and a four hour rated firewall if the buildings on both sides of that firewall are protected by sprinkler systems. So I think that will be popular for some projects. Um, the last change um, highlighted on here is that today our code says that when you have penetrations up to nine square feet, you just fill the void, you stuff it with non-combustible things and hope it will work. Um, that, I'm not sure it really works. And, so recognizing though that we've had a special rule for that and there is lesser risk with those smaller shafts, um, those will now become uh, something that's required to be enclosed in a one hour rated shaft uh, regardless of the height of the building. So not as strict as IBC but a little bit uh, clearer and probably better performance than our code gets today in, on those conditions. Uh, here's a little illustration of that condition about the maximum area of openings being based on fire separation distance. So when you're uh, 30 feet away from the property line or um, closer, if you have protected openings or sprinkler buildings, you can have unlimited area of openings. Um, closer you get to the property line, um, the smaller area of openings you can get. And, and usually in that case, you don't want huge openings on your property line. Uh, but you also note that at five feet from a lot line or three feet from a lot line in a building with sprinklers, you can now have um, openings that are unprotected. So I think whereas Chicago today, if it's a building that requires protected openings, that doesn't happen until you get to 12 feet. So um, there are some trade-offs. In some areas it gets a little harder, but in some areas it gets a little easier, and I think it will work well for a lot of projects. Uh, interior finishes. This is a chapter in our code today that I think, again, um, has a lot of differences without really providing a lot of benefits. And so this new chapter, the new replacement requirements for interior finishes moves much closer to national standards. Many more products are going to meet this chapter off the shelf. There's a few areas where Chicago remains stricter, uh, but the big benefit of this is that the, the products that are out there, the product reps out there, are going to be able to talk in the language of the standards that this code references, as opposed to our code today, which is using outdated classification systems and uh, you know, plays around with some of the number ratings in a confusing way that probably most people don't follow. Um, here's the outline of the chapter, the topics it covers, everything from wall and ceiling finishes to uh, trim, insulation, acoustical ceiling systems. Um, as I said, it, it's going to adopt that standard classification system. Um, there are a few areas, and, and to highlight them, where Chicago remains stricter, and, and hopefully people don't want to get too creative with the finishes in these areas, so in enclosed exit stairs uh, and some conditions in lobbies, 
those are the areas where Chicago remains a little bit stricter than the IBC would allow. Fire protection systems, this is an area where there is a lot of change. Um, so our code today um, does not require nearly as many active fire protection systems, fire alarms, stand pipes, sprinklers, as the national models that are out there. Um, the state fire code, which may or may not apply in Chicago today, depending who you ask. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a joke. But there's actually a law going through in Springfield right now that will clear that up. Um, because they knew we were actually finally updating our code in Chicago, the state fire marshal, unlike the previous state fire marshal who just wanted to fight with us, worked with us, and, and it should be law by the end of this session uh, that says that there is not double regulation anymore in home rule municipalities like Chicago that have local fire and life safety codes. So if that law passes in Springfield, uh, which we expect it will, it is moving through, um, there will not be this need to or question about whether that state fire code, NFPA 101 based state fire code, uh, has to also be followed unless you're doing a state owned facility. So if you're building for the state, you have to follow their code uh, or you're doing a state regulated facility, primarily daycares uh, is where it becomes a conflict. Um, so getting into those systems, uh, there's a lot of different systems covered in detail in this chapter, so sprinkler systems, standpipe systems, fire extinguishers, fire alarm and detection, um, smoke control systems, which you can see in blue, Chicago decided to be a little different there, um, fire command centers in high-rise buildings, the fire department connections, um, carbon monoxide systems, city fire alarm boxes, which are those things that you see out in the street, and I'm not sure anyone thinks they still work, but they do. Uh, they have to be put outside theaters, daycare centers, schools, things like that. Um, and I guess if cell phones fail, and phones fail, um, those boxes are still wired to some telegraph-based system that will send a signal somewhere and someone will respond. So uh, significantly expanded requirements for active fire protection systems that, that we've already covered. So the biggest change is going to be sprinkler systems, I think, uh, in residential buildings with four or more units, uh, and that requirement goes into effect January 1st, 2020 for all projects. Um, they will require sprinkler systems. For rehab conditions, uh, existing residential buildings that are being rehabbed, there are exceptions in the code, um, but if it's a change of occupancy, if you're taking a warehouse and it's going to have four more new residential units, or it's a new construction building with four more residential units, sprinklers are going to be required in Chicago uh, starting January 1st, 2020. Um, also, in assembly occupancies, there is going to be some new requirements and the requirement for office buildings uh, or all other occupancies where there isn't some more specific trigger is going to be buildings over 70 feet. So the high rise system requirements still come in at 80 feet, but the sprinkler requirement will come in at 70 feet. Uh, fire alarm standpipe command center requirements, those are very specific to how the fire department operates. So they made a fair number of suggested amendments to those sections and there may have a few more. So. Uh, one of the reasons the code won't be published in the user-friendly book form until October is that uh, this ordinance moved through very fast. We tried to do our best, but when you're doing 776 pages of ordinance um, in a very short timeline, we knew there were going to be typos and things we didn't get quite right, so we expect there will be a, a slight cleanup ordinance that probably passes City Council sometime this summer, uh, and that will be reflected in the first set of, of formally published books before the code goes into effect. So. Largely, it will be the code that is out there today, the ordinance that's out there today, but there will be a few changes, and I think this is an area where the fire department may have a few more little tweaks that they want uh, to these system requirements. Um, the fire department recognizes that one thing that they don't really permit today, because uh, they aren't required in our code today for the most part, uh, is alternative extinguishing systems. So in restaurants, uh, chemical extinguishing systems in cooking hoods or various other systems like that that are a little more specialized come in as code requirements here and the fire department is working on figuring out what the permitting requirements will be for those systems, uh, hopefully before that goes into effect in December. Um, there are still some specialized requirements that carry over from our current code, so exhibition areas, uh, whether it's McCormick Place size things or uh, smaller exhibition areas that are part of a hotel and then technology centers become telecommunication equipment areas and they have some specialized fire protection requirements as well. Um, the electrical code requirements for fire pumps uh, consistent with the model codes have actually been relaxed uh, 
uh, to recognize that now we're going to have many more systems that are smaller than high-rise buildings that have to have uh, active fire protection systems, sprinklers or standpipes, and, and may need fire pumps to support that based on our low pressure water system in Chicago. So uh, those electric fire pumps in other than high-rise buildings and hospitals will now not be required to be on the emergency uh, secondary power system. So that will allow uh, resizing some generators for some projects. Um, carbon monoxide detectors, there's a requirement in our code today that whether or not there's some source of carbon monoxide, assembly occupancies have to have carbon monoxide detection. Um, no one can quite remember why that was written into the Chicago code or what it was for, uh, so that requirement comes out. Uh, and then smoke control systems, so that's an area where the fire department wasn't quite comfortable with the sort of technology out there around those systems. We haven't really had those systems other than the atriums in our code today. Uh, and so most of those requirements are out. Um, they're moved to an optional Appendix S. If they are installed in the system, however, uh, they must comply with that new Appendix S, which is really the sort of, I think, IBC 909 section requirements related to smoke control systems. But as we go through uh, many of the areas where the IBC would require them, pressurized stairs, pressurized elevator lobbies, are not requirements that we're adopting in Chicago. So um, they really are going to be optional systems driven by a client requirement in most cases other than in atrium conditions. And then city fire alarm boxes, as we mentioned, they're still going to be required as they are today. And we all hope they work and are tested on some basis. Uh, means of egress. Um, this chapter covers exiting. Uh, our current code isn't really very clean with the terms it uses. Everything's an exit, 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 exit. Um, exit is a very specific thing in the model codes. It's when you get to the enclosed part of the means of egress. So um, moving towards the national terminology is hopefully going to clear some things up. Um, we're also going to move towards the IBC-based way of measuring exit width. So goodbye units of exit width and hello multiplier um, based on whether you have a sprinkler system or not. Um, the number of exits is also going to be cleared up. Uh, the Separation between exits is going to be based on the IBC, but with some uh, exceptions that we've recognized for a long time where it isn't possible to meet those absolute uh, percentage or, or fraction of the diagonal requirements. Um, means of egress illumination, that's an area where uh, we're moving towards some more clarity there, but there's still some Chicago-specific requirements, mostly in our electrical code about emergency lighting, um, accessible means of egress, um, that's going to help us integrate with the accessibility code and increase compliance there and really be uh, not have conflicting standards about exiting and, and means of egress uh, for stairs, ramps, things like that. Um, then the middle part of the chapter has some specific requirements about egress features, then the egress path components, uh, and then at the end of the chapter there's some special provisions about assembly, occupancies, rooms like this. Uh, or the spaces with large groups of people gathered have some specialized requirements about aisles and seating and things like that. Um, so the IBC-based egress sizing, uh, IBC-based egress terminology, the IBC-based egress separation with some Chicago exceptions, um, clarifications, um, and for small residential, there are some reduced railing and guard requirements. So we are going to recognize for small residential buildings 36 inch guards, which we haven't recognized before, but consistent with the national uh, model codes there. So some places will no longer be required to have 42 inch guards. Uh, and just an illustration of the sort of terms that apply to the means of egress, which are important to understand for reading through this chapter. And if, um, so the means of egress starts in the, in an occupiable space at the most remote point in that space, so that far corner of the room. Um, it leads out to the exit access, so corridors, uh, open stairs, open ramps are going to be part of the exit access, and they also include the travel distance in the occupiable space. Uh, then you get to the enclosed portion, it's the exit. So it can be an exit stair, it can be an exit corridor, uh, but that is going to be the enclosed portion with limited penetrations, really only for accessing it for exiting purposes, uh, and then you are going to get outside, and then the portion from getting from the end of that enclosed exit to the public way is going to be called the exit discharge. Could be a yard, it could 
be a lobby in some cases in Chicago, and Chicago's requirements did keep more choices to have exit stairs exit through a lobby because of our weather conditions, and, and we have allowed that for a long time. Uh, and then it leads out to a public way, so street, alley, um, other public space. Um, the occupant load factors are going to be a hybrid of current Chicago conditions and IBC conditions. There are some things in our code today that are so old they're new again. Um, for example, in business occupancies, um, I, I think in 1949 when our code was written, um, you had typing pools and, and uh, office staff working in very close quarters, then people spread out, and so the model code has a, a less dense standard for business occupancies, but what we're seeing today in terms of the co-working spaces, the WeWorks and, and so on of the world, everyone is squeezing those office workers in tighter, so we are keeping our 100 square foot per person uh, standard for business occupant load. Um, door re swing restrictions, we've been more restrictive in Chicago and that stays more restrictive. Uh, single exit conditions are going to be much more similar to Chicago and less like the IBC. So the IBC recognizes some single exit conditions from a story in non-residential occupancies. Uh, this code will not, so they are spelled out much in the way that uh, 13160050A through O uh, exceptions are spelled out today, those single exit conditions. Uh, but that also means that we aren't having uh, egress windows in residential occupancies. It's more based on uh, traditional types of means of egress or exits uh, and less reliance on people going out a window that probably in Chicago opens on a very narrow side yard. Um, and then there's some features about egress that we chose not to adopt. Uh, glow in the dark exit markings, which sound neat, but um, in other jurisdictions that have been living with that requirement for 10 years, they tell us that they wear out and have to be replaced and they're just sort of a nightmare and probably don't add a lot. Uh, to safety, pressurized stairs, as I mentioned, are not going to come in as a requirement in Chicago. Um, some model code-based requirements for third stairs and very tall high-rises do not come in uh, because our elevator community does not believe that the trade-off occupant evacuation elevators really would work. Um, so if there wasn't a trade-off, we weren't going to mandate that third stair. Uh, Smoke-protected seating in the assembly chapter, there are some allowances in the model IBC for when you have a smoke control system uh, changing the requirements for the design of seating sections, and, and we did not uh, adopt that here, again, because of deferring some of those questions about smoke control systems to when we look at our mechanical code, and as I mentioned, the residential egress windows are not coming in as a requirement. Uh, for accessibility, um, we went back and forth on this, but we're very excited to say that we were able to work with the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities and uh, adopt some updated accessibility requirements. Um, I, I think the the mayor really deserves a lot of credit for forcing everyone to the table to get this done. Uh, I think it's a big accomplishment. There were some changes in state law late last year uh, that are phasing in through later this year. Uh, this tries to capture those in our code, which we knew we were going to need to do. Um, it's also going to coordinate with some other changes that have been out there or some concerns that were out there about our current code not being fully consistent with the ADA or the Fair Housing Act regulations for some residential occupancies. Um, but for the projects that are government funded, MOPD is going to continue to have some extra requirements there. Uh, often it's city money involved and to protect us there are probably going to continue to be stricter standards. So if it is a project where the city is involved as a funder um, in some way, there are going to continue to be stricter requirements around those to protect us um, from the litigation risk that just exists in this area. Um, and uh, other changes that will happen with this, so all of these take effect December 1st. A again, for projects before December 1st, you're probably going to be working with Chris or our accessibility reviewers and being told that you need to comply with the new Illinois Accessibility Code. This is going to provide a spelled out path that works with our new code, but these accessibility requirements are going to take effect new code, old code for everyone. December 1st, it's going to update to use the 2009 edition of the ANSI A117.1 standard as a baseline, which changes a few dimensions around, but uh, fairly minor. Uh, and then for people who do residential work, uh, multifamily residential work, where you have to have type A units, this provides a new spelled out option for kitchen cabinets, which I think will make a lot of people happy. We think it's consistent with the Illinois Accessibility Code. Uh, and will not necessarily require some of the 
um, strange conditions that people have been building or trying not to build for the last uh, period of time. Uh, interior environment, this chapter covers mostly conditions in residential, some space sizing requirements, uh, but it, it does address a little bit of everything. So it covers ventilation, uh, temperature control, uh, light, natural light requirements, uh, the sizes of yards and courts to borrow, uh, to use for natural light and ventilation, um, the interior space dimensions, again, mostly residential, uh, access to unoccupied spaces, so mechanical rooms and things like that, some requirements about toilets and bathrooms, and then some requirements that are in our code today, uh, updated a little bit to be a little more clear and easier to find about rodent protection on certain openings and, and wall conditions close to the ground. Um, new from IBC are some provisions about attic and, and crawl space ventilation that we really haven't spelled out very clearly before and, and help coordinate with similar provisions in the energy conservation code which we have adopted. Uh, the ceiling height requirement actually comes down consistent with what the model code would require in, in certain residential occupancies and some things that New York City has been doing experimentally to allow lower ceiling heights, uh, especially to encourage the reuse of existing basement space or attic space uh, without expensive modifications. Uh, so a seven foot ceiling height is going to be recognized down from our current expectation of seven foot six. There are some provisions I mentioned earlier about residential loss for sleeping purposes. Again, those are modified from international residential code provisions that were designed for tiny houses, but recognized more broadly here. Uh, and then some things about toilet rooms, non-absorbent surfaces, and a new requirement to Chicago urinal partitions. Uh, one thing that's in model chapter 12 that Chicago did not adopt uh, is sound transmission requirements. So we do not, we will continue not to have any standards around uh, sound transmission, that won't be a code expectation, that will be a, a client-driven expectation in Chicago projects. Um, the provisions about borrowed light and borrowed ventilation um, still are required, so there are still requirements in residential occupancies and some educational occupancies for natural light and, and sometimes natural ventilation, but they're modified a little bit based on some things we've been allowing through various uh, alternative approval processes for the last 10 years um, and, and a little more flexibility. So I think there's some exciting things happening there, still required, but some changes. Um, and especially for duplex down conditions and basements, there are some further modifications to allow some conditions where there may not be required natural ventilation uh, if part of the unit is above grade and there's mechanical ventilation provided. Um, provisions on yards and courts spells that out a little more clearly um, and modifies them slightly from the conditions today. Uh, they are Chicago-based conditions um, and they coordinate a little bit with our, some things in our zoning ordinance, I think. Uh, but there may be further room in years ahead for further coordination there. Um, spelled out in the code and not spelled out entirely how it's going to work, but uh, th something to look forward to. Um, is recognition of permanent easements. So we've been doing this on a case-by-case -case basis uh, when there are properties and they want to use part of open space on a neighboring property if there is a permanent recorded easement, um, that that space is going to stay open and be able to use for that for in perpetuity. Uh, we will recognize that as, as being included in that space for various purposes, especially natural light and ventilation. So for some tight developments, that's a benefit. Um, and uh, the other two points I think we've already covered. So energy efficiency, this is one of the requirements that's going into effect uh, in just a few weeks, June 1st. We will have new forms up on our website, hopefully in a week or two. Uh, so before it goes effect, it takes effect for permit applications that start on or after June 1st. Um, the Chicago cool roof requirements, uh, solar reflectance requirements are moving to the roofing chapter, but they stay in effect after June 1st. Um, this is one area where we're excited that we're finally going to have an energy code and a building code that are talking the same language once we've fully phased this in. So we've had an energy code and it's been based on the International Energy Conservation Code for a number of years, um, but there have been challenges around getting um, everything to meet up in terms of expectations that were in fire requirements about insulation materials uh, and then uh, increasing strict, increasingly strict expectations about insulating new walls. So. I think this code provides a lot more uh, paths to be speaking the same language and, and comply there in, in more innovative ways. Um, and, and one thing, just a reminder out there, so 
a year or two ago, the state transitioned who the free provider of smart, of, of energy code support, technical support was. Uh, it's now provided by the Smart Energy Design Assistance Center at the University of Illinois in Champaign. Um, and they do have a number of webinars and they're going to be doing a number of live programs again in Chicago after the state budget year resets on July 1st. So later this summer, there will be some free live programs in Chicago, uh, but for now there's a number of, of pretty good webinar programs. Um, number of free webinar programs um, that are available at smartenergy.illinois.edu. Uh, exterior wall requirements. Um, this chapter covers the outside of the building, uh, including things that uh, and, and incorporates a number of things that we've been doing by memos or interpretations for a number of years. It puts them all in one place in the code. Uh, covers a range of topics and some newer exterior cladding materials that are popular but we didn't necessarily have a lot of guidance on uh, or our guidance is hard to find. Um, so specific requirements for a wider range of cladding materials, it's going to spell that out. Uh, it's going to provide up-to-date standards on those things so to the extent there were standards in our code, often they were quite old standards that were referenced. Um, the requirements for combustible Cladding materials on the exterior side of exterior walls uh, will be very similar to the 2018 memo for people who are dealing with those uh, cladding products, the metal composite panels, the HPL uh, products. Uh, and then the standards, again, because they are up to date, are going to be consistent with readily available manufacturers' test data because we're one of the first cities in the country to actually be on the 2018 edition of the I-codes. Uh, in some cases, we might now be ahead a little bit by an edition or two of the manufacturer test data and we'll work with you on that if that becomes an issue. Um, some overly prescriptive requirements in the exterior wall chapter uh, were deleted by the technical advisory committee, so recognizing that we were moving from a world uh, that had very little in the way of, of spelling out nailing patterns or spacing of fasteners to a world where the IBC has a little too much of that. Some of that is not being adopted by Chicago, at least for now. Um, the provisions for combustible cladding, like the 2018 memo, really do allow those materials, but in a way that's a little more restrictive than the base IBC. It, it cancels out some of those exceptions that would allow things to be used a little too liberally. Uh, EFIS without drainage continues to be a prohibited material. It's prohibited today, uh, and the technical advisory group thought it really did not work for Chicago's climate, so it continues to be banned. Uh, and there are some provisions at the end of the exterior wall chapter about plastic composite decking. Um, it's there, it can be used, but it's not suddenly becoming a non-combustible material. We get that question a little too much. Um, so it is still going to be subject to those limitations on being a combustible material and how close it can be to property lines or based on construction type. Um, chapter 15 covers roof assemblies and also rooftop structures. So those occupied rooftops and mechanical penthouses. Um, beginning, it starts out with roof drainage, and roof drainage we're going to come back and look at again some more uh, in coordination with the plumbing code because that's an area where we know there's some things that are a little Chicago different, uh, but it really is tied into the plumbing code and will be covered uh, later this year or next year when we look at that. Um, there are some more performance requirements uh, around roofs and, and rooftop structures more spelled out than today. I think our code today probably half a page contains all our roofing standards and now it's going to a chapter that's uh, 20 or 30 pages long um, and, and hopefully provides some more clear guidance than our code today. Um, material specific requirements, so it lists out a range of materials that are allowed or uh, not allowed and the conditions under which they are allowed. And then we get into the unoccupied rooftop structures, so that's modified provisions from the IBC. And then towards the end of the chapter, there's some Chicago specific things we added. So there's a provision on those occupiable rooftops, uh, which is our new name for rooftop decks. Um, vegetative roofs and roof gardens, those are borrowed from the International Fire Code uh, and amended a little bit for Chicago. And then our longstanding requirements for uh, solar reflectance cool roofs. Um, the provisions that are in the model code about re-roofing and roof repairs, um, they didn't really fit in the building code, which is generally about new construction, uh, so they've been relocated to the building rehabilitation code, which is where they really apply. Uh, you're not going to be putting a, 
replacing a roof on a new construction building, hopefully, or, or you shouldn't be getting a permit for it, separate from the, the base building permit. Um, and the, those uh, green roofs and vegetative roofs are going to finally have some standards that are a little more, a bit more spelled out, so there's a little more consistency and clarity about what our expectations there around those. Um, for the unoccupied rooftop features, uh, the Chicago requirements are going to be a little more tailored for us, and then for the occupied rooftops, that is going to spell out those requirements. It's going to largely be consistent with, again, we did an ordinance around some of those topics two or three years ago, so it's going to be largely consistent with that, um, but put it in language consistent with this new code that we're adopting and the rest of the country speaks. Um, structural design, chapter 16. So this is a, a provision, a, a chapter that covers a lot of things and some things are going to be very consistent with what we've been doing and then there's some new things that come in here, um, either uh, for the most case relaxed, uh, but for some projects, higher risk projects, uh, a little bit stricter. Um, so this covers everything, earthquake loads, wind loads, snow loads, uh, ice loads. Um, it's going update to use the 2016 edition of ASC 7. Um, one thing to keep in mind about both the IBC provisions and the ASC 7 provisions, uh, it uses ultimate loads instead of working loads like our code today. So it might look like the numbers are going up, but they are not apples to apples numbers. Um, they in many cases are going down even though the absolute numbers uh, are going up because one is expressed in ultimate loads and one is expressed in working loads. Our current code is in working loads, so lower numbers, uh, which if expressed as ultimate loads would be even bigger. Um, one thing that this code does, which our current code does not do a great job of doing uh, in the structural area is really recognizing that there's a gradient of risk. Um, so there is a risk classification section at the beginning of the chapter. We've modified it a little bit for Chicago. Um, but it's saying that low risk buildings and ordinary risk buildings don't have to meet the same structural requirements as high hazard buildings that are really going to cause a problem uh, or need to have more reliability in case of a major uh, event, earthquake, wind, uh, storm. Um, so that's something new for Chicago and is going to allow us to relax the requirements on the very low end uh, for storage structures, uh, small residential buildings and really only have those requirements triggered for big high-risk things, high-rise buildings, hospitals, and so on. Uh, similarly, uh, there's a little bit more gradation uh, on single-family home porches, uh, balconies that are only attached to a single unit. Uh, a while ago when Chicago got stricter about the porch loads, it sort of went across the board. And while porches that are shared exits will continue to be 100 pounds per square foot, uh, consistent with the model codes, those smaller porches, decks, balconies uh, are going to be able to drop down to 60 pounds per square foot as the design live load. Um, and then Chicago is going to adopt some seismic requirements, recognizing that we're in a relatively low seismic risk area. Um, they are not terribly burdensome for most projects, but for the bigger projects, projects on bad soils uh, or risky facilities like hospital emergency rooms or facilities with hazardous chemicals, there are going to be some hazardous some seismic requirements. Um, the Chicago Code, when it's published in the book form later this year, will replace all of those maps uh, of the country with specific Chicago values, so you won't have to look at a map of Alaska anywhere in the Chicago Building Code. Um, additional details have been provided for some common conditions in live load table, um, so some conditions about mechanical rooms and and uh, server rooms have been spelled out a little better uh, with advice from structural engineers who were on that advisory committee. Uh, the wind forces for small ordinary risk buildings like a single family home will be reduced approximately 20%. Uh, and uh, there will continue to be a simplified wind force section for some ordinary conditions in Chicago. Although by moving to uh, very close to the national code, there are also a number of very good tools out there uh, that you can use to apply ASC uh, provisions to projects um, without knowing a lot about structural engineering. Um, seismic design, just to go over this, this is something that's scary. Everyone says, oh, we're going to have seismic design and it's going to be like California. No, it's, it's going to be like the seismic design required in Evanston or Oak Park or anywhere outside of Chicago that's already following the IBC. Uh, and in some cases, 
a, a little bit adjusted. So um, small residential buildings, the one to three unit residential buildings or the other sort of unclassified small residential buildings are going to be totally exempt. Just skip over seismic requirements and keep going. Um, for a project designed with prescriptive wood framing, also exempt. So the seismic um, redundancy is already built into those prescriptive wood framing methods. Uh, Non-occupied storage structures, also exempt. Um, so then when you actually get into having requirements, the lowest level of requirements, seismic design classification A, really says the building has to have a continuous load path, which hopefully all of them already did. Um, and it's not getting into reinforcing mechanical systems or bracing anything like that. So ordinary risk buildings up to 60 feet, so all buildings up to 60 feet other than hospitals and hazardous chemical facilities uh, are going to be in seismic design category A regardless of their soil uh, or structural system. Uh, and based on their structural system, that exception might apply up to about 130 feet. Only on high-risk buildings, tall buildings, or soil that's really bad, and we don't have a lot of it, but we have some of it here in Chicago, will there be heightened seismic requirements? And those sort of requirements about bracing mechanical systems are only really going to be triggered when you get into those very specialized facilities, hospitals with emergency uh, care or, uh, or uh, hazardous chemicals on site. Um, special inspections and tests. This is going to be an area that is going to be a little bit new for Chicago and we're going to have to work uh, very closely with industry to make sure this rolls out in a smooth way. Uh, so one thing that the model codes rely on and other jurisdictions rely on um, when there are a wider range of materials allowed, um, some of those materials are more complicated, more sensitive if they aren't installed correctly uh, to creating a risk. So there is a reliance on having a little bit more, uh, some third parties supplement departmental inspections in the construction process. Um, so we have adopted those requirements here uh, in some ways with some modifications. Uh, there is recognition that some small projects will not have to be subject to those requirements. Some standard materials will not have to be subject to those requirements. But for some materials, there will be these requirements and there will be more guidance from the department and probably another presentation like this specifically around this for contractors to understand uh, what our expectations are going to be around special inspections and tests as we roll this out uh, late this year and, and more in 2020. Um, soils and foundations, this is an area where um, it, it's a, a good hybrid, I think, of the model code provisions and what we've been doing uh, for a long time. So this spells out when a geotechnical investigation is required and at what point in the design process or permitting process it needs to be available and recognizing that the way we've done it here for a long time is, is not the way the model code would spell it out. Um, the model code has been amended largely to reflect um, how it's been done in Chicago to date. Um, there's going to be uh, incorporation of some things about deep foundations, which are fairly specialized, but uh, the people who work on those were very excited that those were being folded into this code and made permanent. Um, and then some things about foundation drainage, uh, which again tie into plumbing and stormwater and some of those issues uh, will probably be revisited in phase three when we deal with those in depth. Um, for geotechnical investigations, again spelling out that we're going to be different than what the model code says about how these work. Uh, there's three exemptions from full investigation, uh, so single-story structures up to 2,000 square feet, uh, storage structures up to 2,000 square feet, alterations and additions with less than 5% uh, increase in live load or, or loads, uh, and some shallow excavations can use a conservative presumptive value table. Um, Pre-permit exemption from investigation, um, so that means that we will continue to allow assumed values on permit drawings as long as those are confirmed in the field before construction works begins. Uh, that's going to be the smaller buildings up to four stories co covering up to 16,000 square feet uh, and with no excavation below eight feet called for in the drawings. Um, once we get into these material specific chapters, um, I'm going to go through them more quickly because what I have to say about them is, is pretty much the same. The highlight is that we are moving to up-to-date standards for recognition of these various products. Um, and these chapters, there wasn't a lot of Chicago specific already in there, and there wasn't a lot of disagreement that we needed to keep something that was Chicago special. So um, 
There's a few highlights as we go through about new materials that are recognized. Uh, structural use of shotcrete will now have code provisions spelled out. Before that would have required uh, special requests and meetings with us to go over uh, and understand exactly what was being requested, but now it will be spelled out in the code. Uh, similarly for aluminum, our code today really didn't recognize aluminum at all, especially for structural uses. Uh, it will be recognized. Uh, it may or may not meet requirements for combustibility, um, so it may or may not be a non-combustible material, but is recognized for structural uses with those limitations. Uh, masonry, our code today says very little about masonry and how it's supposed to be designed. Um, there's some references to some very old reference standards. Uh, the masonry industry, masons in Chicago have been asking for a long time for us to have an updated masonry code and this will accomplish that. Um, it will retain some of the Chicago specific limitations from our experience from the 90s and 2000s with the poor performance of certain single wife masonry for residential applications so it will maintain those stricter requirements. Uh, and so Chicago has been working on updating its code for a long time and, and really thought it was there in the early 2000s. So as part of that, they adopted a new mechanical code and repealed some old provisions. Uh, some of the provisions they repealed thinking that there would be a new building code in a few months uh, were all of Chicago's provisions about masonry chimneys and fireplaces. Um, and no one has actually filled them back in since then. So we've had about uh, 15 years with no requirements for masonry fire places and chimneys and no guidance if you want to do it. Um, so we will actually get those back in our code with this ordinance. Um, steel, um, again, recognition of the latest standards. Um, one thing, we have a memo that we put out about two years ago about the use of cold form light frame construction uh, and some limitations around that and expectations about masonry cores, uh, both for structural reasons and fire protection reasons. Uh, and so that will remain for buildings over 55 feet in height. Um, and then one thing, and it's not really steel, but it got stuck in this chapter for existing conditions where there is cast iron that needs to be evaluated. Uh, some provisions from our code today about the evaluation of existing cast iron are stuck in the back of the steel chapter. Um, wood, this is an area where I think there's a lot of excitement, interest about doing things with wood. This is really dealing with structural uses of wood. Um, we're moving towards recognizing more. Um, there are still some limitations on it, as I said earlier. Um, Chicago has some skepticism about fire retardant treated wood in, in certain applications and is more restrictive on that still. Uh, we've had some bad experience with it in weather exposed conditions in Chicago and deteriorating more rapidly than it should. Um, but we are recognizing those. Um, cross laminated timber, which is popular and we hear a lot about, uh, still is going to require case-by-case case approval, so that is going to require a meeting with us to make sure that we understand what's going on uh, with that. And, and hopefully in a few years that can be further relaxed as we have more experience with that, but that was one of the uh, limitations imposed around that. Um, there is going to be explicit recognition of some prescriptive framing methods for smaller light frame wood construction uh, as a path to simplified structural design for some of those small end structures, that is going to be a good option. There's guidance out there around doing that in various ways from the wood industry and others. Um, and then up-to-date standards for fire retardant treated wood. So it is recognized for some applications today. It's going to be recognized for a broader range of applications, but it's not recognized for the full range of applications that the model code would allow. So don't let the wood, in let wood industry representative tell you it's allowed everywhere. Uh, there are still limitations in Chicago um, but there are going to be some, so we'll work with them to try and not have them oversell that. Uh, glass and glazing, so Chicago has been relatively silent or fairly restrictive about some of the topics in this chapter, and, and we are moving really towards the national standards on this. So recognition of the structural use of glass without special permission or uh, spelling things out. Um, recognition of more contemporary requirements for safety glazing where it's required and, and what can perform as safety glazing, so there will be some additional limitations on the use of wired glass above and beyond our code today, uh, but also some recognition of some newer safety glazing types without special permission. Um, and then some better spelled out requirements for use of glass guards and some broader recognition of um, non-glass plastic-based glazing for some skylight conditions uh, is both in this chapter and the plastic chapter. Um, gypsum board gypsum, panel products, and plaster. Uh, this is 
uh, again, up to date, I'm going to sound like a broken record here, up to date standards, uh, but this one actually is older than our current code. The standard that's referenced is from 1946 and uh, gold star to anyone who can actually find the 1946 standard on, on plaster use. I, I'm not sure anyone has a copy of that. Well, someone probably does. Um, I know the department does not, so I, I don't know how we're enforcing it. Um, uh, updated use for some structural use of gypsum panel products, probably a, a pretty rare application here, but there are some provisions for it. Uh, and then interior and exterior plaster and stucco applications. Uh, plastics chapter. Um, actually, plastics, we have put some provisions in our code, so we're not as out of date in this area as uh, one might have thought, um, especially around foam plastic insulation. We do have some requirements from uh, 10 or 20 years ago about that, um, but those are carried forward in citing newer editions of the reference standards there. Um, some more clear provisions about plastic trim and veneer and light transmitting plastics and plastic glazing. Uh, I think that's an area where we've gotten lots of questions about. There's some strange references to it in the rehab code that exists today, um, but this will recognize that there are some applications where plastic for skylight use is acceptable. Um, and then some provisions in this chapter, um, understandably the fire department wanted to be more restrictive than IBC and that is accomplished. And then um, just like today, although some people don't know they exist today, there are fire limits that are defined as an area around downtown where there are stricter requirements. Uh, one area is exterior use of plastics will continue to have some greater restrictions within those fire limits that there's a slide later on to show where they are. Uh, electrical. I think I previously mentioned uh, that there were some, you know, largely we did our electrical code uh, in 2017, uh, but there were some further amendments around the edges to be consistent with this code. Uh, so recognition that there are now two types of uh, emergency loads, emergency loads and standby power. Uh, so things like elevators, when they are on an emergency power system, can have a 60 cent second delay of switching over to the backup power. Uh, so that's going to allow some more reasonable sizing of those emergency generators or backup systems. Uh, we already mentioned the change around fire pump emergency power uh, more consistent with the model codes. And then there are some provisions uh, to build upon some things we did in terms of alternative energy in our electrical code. Now if you want to have on-site storage, so battery systems related to that, we adopted some provisions to provide for the fire protection of those rooms or spaces where those batteries are going to be located. Um, that's the one piece of the International Fire Code that we did adopt in this round. Mechanical systems, uh, mechanical code is going to be considered in phase three. We recognize that there's some things about our mechanical code that continue to be out of date and it's definitely on our list. Uh, we'll continue to consider mechanical code adjustments on a case-by-case -case basis through the alternative code approval or standards and test process. And you know, just like we did leading up to this ordinance that I'm presenting about, uh, the commissioner really would very much like to hear from industry with recommendations. Uh, I say top 10 because I don't want more than 10, but if you only have two or three, that's fine. But I don't want a list of 100. Um, so you can send that to DOB commissioner at cityofchicago.org uh, and we'll put those together um, as we're organizing for what may or may not be considered uh, in phase three for changes to our mechanical code based on the 2018 international mechanical code. Uh, plumbing systems, similarly, uh, will be considered in phase three. Um, we have the plumbing material pilot program that's been ongoing uh, for a while now. Uh, we continue to gather data there around the use of PVC and other alternative materials for plumbing piping. Uh, that will continue through December of 2019. Um, again, top 10 recommendations, send them to DOB commissioner at cityofchicago.org. Um, we do want to hear from you. We do recognize that there are changes needed there. Um, and it is building consensus with all of our industry partners about what those changes are and, and how we phase those in. Uh, conveyance devices, this is an area where uh, the substantive requirements of how they work were, were updated in phase one, so that's not really changing, uh, but some things about the spaces and rooms and layout of how they work in buildings uh, is changing a little bit in this code. Um, so new from the IBC, there will be a requirement uh, and a little less um, higher thresholds for triggering it than the IBC. So in new buildings and additions with six or more stories or two or more basement levels, at least one elevator must accommodate a stretcher and there's some dimensional things illustrated up there and guidance from your elevator providers about accommodating a stretcher. So 
Um, we did recognize that there are some lower rise buildings that aren't, have smaller elevators and aren't going to meet that. Um, so we did adjust that trigger, uh, but it will be required in, in six or more stories or two or more basements. Uh, and then there's some clarifications in this code about the fire rating of uh, elevator machine rooms that has been a topic that wasn't very clear in our code to this point. So some things that we did not adopt from the model code. So salespeople will come and tell you that you need to do these things now that they're IBC based, but you do not. Um, so elevator lobbies and elevator pressurization are not required in this code. So some of the things about the little uh, screens or doors that close as supplemental things over elevator doors are not required in our code. Similarly, you aren't required to enclose the elevator lobbies. Um, fire service elevator requirements, we've had those in our code today for high-rise buildings and they really stay Chicago-based. I think the one change in the fire service elevators is there's a new um, signage requirement. So um, the IBC fire service elevator requirements are much more uh, technically difficult to meet. So I think there's probably a lot of good things about not adopting those for now. Special construction, this chapter covers uh, specialized conditions, greenhouses like shown, um, walkways, tunnels, tents, temporary structures, membrane structures, broadcast towers, solar energy systems, fences, uh, things like that. So there are very specific provisions on all of those if you have any of those in your project. Uh, the Chicago tent requirements are, are largely staying. The Chicago tent requirements, um, fences is a Chicago specific provision that was put in there. Um, but for solar energy systems, there's now some clearer things about what's happening on the building side, again, to build on, on technical requirements we put in the electrical code two years ago. Um, and then the, the Chicago-specific provisions for fences continue. Um, public way, so this is an area where largely we don't regulate it at the Department of Buildings. Uh, once you get into the public way, you have to work with CDOT and the Department of Business Affairs and Consumer Protection to get permission to use that space, but there are a few provisions in the building code and some pointers in the building code to refer to those sections. Um, this will maintain the Chicago requirements about, the, in certain cases, the building department is the authorizing source for deep foundations that extend into the public way and, and some conditions related to vaulted sidewalks. And then new to this code is recognition of seasonal weather protection vestibules, so those little things they put outside uh, often restaurants or retail spaces uh, can be up for part of the year and are going to be of some kind of uh, often fabric covered structure. So this provides some guidance about what those need to be from a, a building fire code perspective. Uh, worksite safety and operations. So this is a chapter that's going to pull together some provisions uh, both from our existing code and from the model code about protecting not so much the workers on site because that is regulated largely by OSHA uh, or the Depart Illinois Department of Labor, but this is about protecting neighbors and, and other uh, building occupants if it's a partially occupied building. Um, this is going to centralize some existing requirements and also bring in some new ones. Uh, again, this is an area where we're going to have to work with the industry partners who are going to have to carry this out more on the uh, contractor side than on the design professional side. Um, so there are provisions in the code that it may be uh, delayed in enforcement or have a, a different effective date. So we'll have more education out there around these requirements as we get closer to December. Um, building rehabilitation, so jumping out of order, there's a, a hole in the IBC where there used to be a chapter 34 that dealt with this. Now the international codes have moved it to a separate code and, and it's adopted here as a separate code as well. So in Chicago it will be Title 14R, the Chicago Building Rehabilitation Code. Uh, it's based on the international existing building code. Um, it's broken out uh, and there's lots of choices and flexibility to deal with a range of projects, everything from small repair projects up to really complex building reuse, change of use, adaptive reuse projects. So the beginning of the chapter starts out with scope and purpose and definitions. Uh, then there's some provisions in chapter three that apply to all of the compliance methods. So chapter three applies regardless of what you're doing and there's some Chicago specific amendments I'll cover in a minute to moving some things into chapter three to make sure everyone is doing them. Uh, chapter four covers repairs. Uh, chapter five through th 13 cover the various other compliance methods for alterations and additions and change of use. Uh, 
Uh, chapter 14 deals with some things about if you're relocating or moving a building from one site to another, uh, and then uh, continuing to recognize the uh, federal government standards for uh, determining the fire resistance equivalent of archaic materials. Those provisions that apply to all compliance methods, just to reiterate those, so there's some general things, structural things, accessibility things, those are in the base international existing building code. Chicago moved re-roofing here because re-roofing can really be a repair or an alteration, uh, and those are largely IBC based, but they're moved around in the IBC structure. Um, fire escapes, that's something that Chicago has very specific requirements about. We probably have more existing ones out there uh, than many other places. Um, and so we have some Chicago specific things to say about fire escapes, whether they're repairs or uh, altering one, you really can't build a new one in most cases. Uh, electrical things, um, when there is a change of use in a building that might trigger some specialized requirements in the electrical code. Uh, and then residential occupancies, there's some things about, from our rehab code today, about depending on how many units you're adding or things you're doing to change a residential occupancy, uh, some very specific requirements around that. Uh, repair, I think, is the, the clearest area. It very nicely spells out what a repair is and repair is the low end and it really allows you to keep whatever was there as an existing condition. You can repair it, you can use the same materials for the most part, uh, you can rebuild it in the same configuration for the most part, you just can't change it to make it less compliant with the code as part of the repair. Um, there's a few tiny little exceptions to that, um, so if it already is out of compliance with some of the retroactive requirements in our code today, 13196, uh, chapter 13196, or in the new code, Title 14X, those minimum standards that are supposed to apply to all existing buildings, um, then the repair should be bringing it up to that standard, or you have to have a discussion with us uh, about why it can't meet a requirement there and get an alternative code approval for an existing non-conforming uh, condition that falls below those standards. Um, the Illinois Accessibility Code has some uh, unusual triggers, especially around plumbing repairs that may require some accessibility upgrades. Um, I think we've had ongoing discussions about whether that's going to change, but that's the current state of the Illinois Accessibility Code. And then use of hazardous materials. So just because it's an existing condition, there are some limitations. You can't replace existing asbestos with new asbestos or lead-based paint with new lead-based paint. Um, those are not allowed. Um, there are a couple of paths for complying with the rehab code when you get into alterations, additions, and change of occupancy. So the prescriptive compliance method is the strictest and, and really for small projects that might be easy to follow, but it really starts with everything complies with new construction with these exceptions. Um, so it's probably not the most ideal path except for something that's very straightforward alteration work. Um, the probably the most widely used is going to be what the model code calls the work area compliance method. So it's looking at how much of the building or space is being covered and the bigger the area, uh, the bigger percentage area that is being affected uh, or the number of floors or um, means of egress being touched, the more the requirements go up. So that is the sort of level one, two, and three alteration and work area method that I think we'll all have discussions about going forward if you're doing alteration work because um, it has a lot of guidance, but it also has a lot of room, as with anything with rehab, uh, that is going to have to be spelled out uh, more clearly. And then for the most complicated projects, um, there is now a performance compliance method which allows you to use a point scoring system to evaluate um, whether uh, there are trade-offs in a, a rehab project that are going to allow you to upgrade certain things and not fully meet the standards on other things to retain existing conditions. Uh, and accomplish a, a passing score. So for people who worked on life safety evaluations or who are familiar with that, this is very similar to that process, uh, which Chicago used to evaluate the condition of existing buildings or require upgrades in existing high rises that weren't putting in sprinkler systems. Uh, this is now allowing it to be used, uh, or a very similar method to be used for evaluating uh, alteration projects. So I think there's a lot of excitement around that. Uh, as providing a path for very complex rehabilitation projects uh, to go forward with a little more clarity. We are going to have some department procedures around evaluating those reports. That's not going to go through the normal permit process. Uh, 
that will probably require some meetings with supervisors to go over that point scoring report to make sure we really agree uh, before it's used for the basis of permitting. Um, again, we, we talked about the chapter three has these Chicago specific things about roofing, fire escapes, electrical. Um, the change of occupancy provisions, so the model code is written for some um, busy body jurisdiction that has a lot of time to go see every little change of use out there that happens and wants to issue a permit for it. Um, we really only want to issue a permit when you are making changes to the building uh, or completely changing the occupancy group. Um, but if you're changing from one business to another and they aren't making structural or significant changes to the space, that really doesn't require a permit in Chicago today and we didn't want it to trigger a permit. So those change of occupancy provisions have been uh, substantially rewritten for Chicago to reflect that. Um, and then the performance method that I talked about, the point scoring method, um, under the model code allows I-2 occupancies, hospitals, um, but that was not included in Chicago's adoption. Towards the end, uh, chapter 35 covers reference standards, so one nice thing about the model code is that it puts the all of the year and specific details about reference standards in one chapter at the end, so you don't end up with uh, chapter one referencing the 1999 edition of a standard, and chapter two referencing the 1987 edition, and chapter three uh, referencing one that doesn't exist. Um, so hopefully by putting them in the end, it will be easier to keep them up to date uh, and consistent. And, and this was tried earlier, and it didn't necessarily work in Chicago. Uh, but hopefully it will work this time. And this is just an example from ICC about how to read that. So in that chapter, it goes through, it lists the agency's acronym in, in big letters and then lists all of the standards uh, throughout and then the sections where you might find that standard referenced in the rest of the code and an address for finding the agency if you want to uh, track down a copy of their standard. Uh, chapter 36 is where Chicago is adopting the appendices, and most of them we're not adopting from the IBC, but there are two that we are, and then the one that I mentioned earlier that we're adding. Uh, so Appendix D is Chicago's modified Appendix D, uh, captures the fire limits. Uh, Appendix E is some supplementary accessibility requirements, so th things about uh, telephones and transit stations, some things that aren't necessarily building code, but are additional accessibility requirements that apply uh, when those features are included. And then Chicago's Appendix S, which is really relocating some things from model IBC uh, chapter nine to an optional appendix that applies if you are putting in smoke control systems. Uh, for the fire limits, so today the fire limits extend from Division to Roosevelt and west to Halstead from the lake. Um, under this ordinance, they are expanding to cover the additional areas of expanded downtown zoning that were adopted uh, three or four years ago by the Department of Planning and Development. Um, the restrictions that apply in fire limits, um, frame construction, type five construction is limited. Uh, group H occupancies, hazardous occupancies are prohibited. Um, and there are some enhanced fire rating requirements for exterior walls and some further limitations on exterior wall materials. Um, then Chicago adopted a fire prevention code it really is sort of a placeholder fire prevention code for now. This is something that in phase three, the fire department is going to do some more work on to evaluate some of those specialized occupancy provisions of the international fire code. Um, but for now, uh, there is a provision that allows the fire department, the fire prevention bureau to uh, issue a, a written guidance that says they're enforcing any provision of the 2018 international fire code before adoption. So it could be for a specific project, you go in and meet with them. Uh, you have a dry cleaners or some other uh, facility that has some specialized provisions that are more up to date in that model code than in our code today. Um, so it could be project specific or the fire department may say across the board they want all uh, fruit treatment facilities that use ethylene gas to meet the chapter in the international fire code that deals with that. Um, that is an option today until we fully get through that transition. Uh, the one piece that we did adopt, there are some definitions that are cross-referenced between the codes. Uh, and then the energy storage systems, the spaces for storing batteries uh, related to solar or wind power are adopted in chapter 12 of the new fire code. Um, the minimum standards for existing buildings, these are restated in new code terms. Um, they're fully going to phase in and replace the existing standards sometime in the spring of 2012 once we've been able to update 
our systems and get through heat enforcement season, which is one of the busiest times on our enforcement side of the department. Um, these are the minimum standards that all buildings need to meet and property maintenance things. The one thing that is stuck in this chapter and, and may eventually migrate uh, into the new construction requirements, and it's fairly specialized, is there are some requirements about security features in rental apartments that are in our code today. Um, they're a little hard to find today. Um, hopefully they don't remain hard to find, but there's certain things about locks and peepholes required on unit entrance doors in rental uh, residential conditions that are only found in this code, but they are out there. Uh, and as I mentioned, the transition will happen in the spring of 2020 uh, with guidance from the department in advance. And that is the end of my presentation. So thank you everyone for coming. Thank you.